amigos. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for visiting today uh, my city, my home. I am here waiting for you to show you with big enthusiasm a very special tour. And first of all, let me say to all women in the group here and all women in the world, a happy Women's Day. We are the motor of our homes, of our families. My grandmother used to say that uh, the men is the head and women are the neck. The neck moves the head, whatever she wants. <laughs> and well, I thought this is a very strange way of describing the role of women. But over the history, women have been always uh, that voice uh, that has been usually very low, quite silent for moments, but has been the motor, the motor of the changes. She, as an educator also in their homes, has been the heroine uh, also of the uh, families in necessities. Uh, she has been in all ways the spirit, the heart of our societies. So, hola Diana, hello Marilyn. Thank you, thank you for coming today. And this is a very special tour, actually for me, besides being related with the day of women around the world, because in today's event that I am hosting from my home, and I will tell you in a moment why I'm hosting it from my home, um, we are going all the, the, the tips that we will be able to raise in this tour are uh, to be uh, donating them to the Ukrainian Red Cross, the Red Cross that is supporting in this moment the situation in Ukraine. And also the, uh, the tips will support also our guides in Ukraine. So um, thank you so much if you are able to support this event, if you like it, if you enjoy it. But most importantly, through well, this event, we are going to be able to uh, support this, this cause. Uh, so um, here, well, from my little corner in the world, I just want to, uh, in a way, honor women, honor the women of the past and honor the fighters, the women that are fighting in their country in Ukraine, uh, trying to um, stay there for their families, for their husbands, their spouses, for their kids, and also uh, to keep alive uh, that nationalism uh, that we all have, that sense of belonging, right? And not just giving up, right? So, gracias, Diana. Well, English is not my first language. Sometimes it's easier to explain yourselves in your language, but I really hope uh, that well, my words uh, uh, today about this theme we're going to be talking about and also well about the situation that people are living in Ukraine will be well understand it. And well, the reasons why I'm conducting this tour today here in my home, I, I was thinking in, in, in different possible locations in Lima, but the personalities today we're going to be talking about, they don't have really like uh, places in the historic center dedicated to them, to their memories. Although these ladies that I've chosen passed away some years ago, and they are so, so, so important for, for Peru, for what they have done, right? So it, maybe their, their memory still is too fresh oh, for, for us oh, to, to commemorate them with big monuments, with big plazas, and more time needs to pass. But I wanted to summarize the work of three women that have offered the best of themselves, the best of their lives um, to defend uh, and consolidate what is being Peruvian, uh, to try to also help us understand what is being Peruvian. In different works, the, the three women I'm going to be talking about today, um, they have no relation between them. Uh, they never met in person. 
they live also uh, for moments uh, at the same time in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. And I'm sure at least one of them you will be able to recognize. Uh, so, well, today we are going to talk about great female figures, great women of Peru. And this is going to be explained by a Peruvian. So the intention of this event is telling you also the impact of these women that I'm going to be dedicating this tour uh, to um, in the lives of nowadays, uh, a younger generation, right? So, and of course, uh, uh, here I have a flower with me, which represents also the event uh, that we many guys around the world are conducting because there has been a, a nice collaboration among different guides in different parts of the world. And this rose is very different possibly than the one you've seen in all the tours today uh, because this one is not a natural rose. This is a rose that was made by someone, right? And I bought this rose some time ago in the streets of Lima from a lady, an indigenous woman that was with her kids uh, in the streets. She was making these roses and selling them to the drivers, right? And the rose, uh, maybe there's nothing too special about it, but to me, it represented the sacrifice that woman did uh, on, on doing this, selling them very cheap, investing lots of her time in this, in this rose. She was the hero of those children there. And I bought this rose for that purpose, uh, for remembering that sacrifice she was doing. Uh. Anyways, <laughs> so I am a very sensitive person. <laughs> Sorry if during this day also, sometimes my eyes turn red because these three characters I'm going to talk about today, all of them, are very, very special to me. And I will tell you why in a moment. So are you ready to start this tour? Thumbs up if you're ready. Thumbs up if you want to see more about these women. Gracias, Maria. Thank you. And thanks for coming today, by the way, my friends. I counted with, with you. I, I knew you would be here. I know this is a special day for you all. So thanks for giving me some minutes of your time, your precious day, uh, to learn about great, figures of the 20th century, Peruvian female figures of the 20th century. Gracias, Nani. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's start. So today we are going to focus in three women, two women that were uh, considered in the days mm, sort of like transgressors. They transgredieron, we say in Spanish, uh, their position, their situation, uh, what they were supposed to do as women, although they are 20th century figures, right? So we are not in the 17th century, 18th century, this is the 20th century. So let's start with the first character of our event. And please, can you tell me do you recognize this image? Do you recognize this lady? She is indeed one of the most famous, most international character, uh, characters of Peru. So let me now tell you the name. Possibly the name will sound a little bit more familiar. So we are talking about Ima Sumac. Ima Sumac, a famous... Peruvian a singer, or a famous soprano that became internationally popular in the decade of the 1940s and 1950s. Her name, actually she was not born uh, Ima Sumac, which by the way is a Quechua name and means uh, the most beautiful, uh, the beautiful, Mm -hmm. uh, she became a success, an international success worldwide, from the United States to even the Soviet Union. So yes, Diana, of course, of course, now I think we are finding who's the person, right? 
So here you can see, well, that she was born in 1922. And there is a really interesting thing about her origins because um, people were not very sure if they were, uh, a, let's say, from Cajamarca. Oh, it's a, a town, actually, my family comes from Cajamarca, the town of Ichocan, or Callao, Callao, very close to Lima City. Mm -hmm. So I have today some videos that I would like to play for you. Hopefully, the internet will be very helpful. And here the interviewer is asking her her origin. While visiting Hollywood for a singing engagement, Ema Sumac, the Capitol Records songbird, whose albums are the sensation of the music world, looks over the news clippings about her much discussed ancestry and exclusively for Hollywood Newsreel, once and for all settles the question of whether she's a native of Bolivia, Brooklyn, or Peru. Although I love the people from Brooklyn and Bolivia, I was not born there. I was born in Peru. The name of my little town is Ichocan, with the population of 200. And uh, I used to go out in the morning to sing with the birds. I imitate the birds, all kinds of animals. So she mentions in this video, by the way, my friends, were you able to, to see, to hear correctly the video, just let me know because I have many of those I would like to be sharing. Okay, Maria, just little clips. Gracias, Larry. So you can see, well, first of all, how beautiful she was, uh, how uh, beautiful features indigenous. So uh, there is, of course, well, this halo of mystery around uh, this, this woman, which actually uh, comes from a, a family of uh, indigenous Peruvian uh, people. When she was very young in her town of Ichocan, uh, in Cajamarca, in the North Andes of Peru, she was discovered. And at age 30, uh, 13, sorry, years old, she was taken to Lima. The, the mystery, you know, like the, the, the legend says that uh, by a, 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 a important uh, man related with the government of Peru, he realized how, how beautiful her voice was. So she had no official uh, education in the singing. And, well, she became uh, right uh, after... Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, let's say, sort of like employed to sing. She unfortunately was not able to become famous in Peru. She became famous in the United States. So what I was sharing with you is something that it's called, and let me now share with you this. Oh, sorry, I'm moving. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, well, were you able to hear the voice and the high notes she was able to reach? So the high notes, which in this section you can see whether it is called the triple or triple coloratura which is similar to the thrill of the birds. So she had literally the, 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 the capacity of reproducing the sound that the birds did. And she said that she learned that in the Andes, imitating the voice or the singing of the birds. She never received any formal education for singing, like, and, and never did it even after she became very famous because uh, she believed that a formal education in singing would ruin her natural, oh, let's say, um, voice, right? So uh, she is the only Peruvian and also first Latina in receiving a star in the Walk of Fame of Hollywood, right? 
And also part of the mystery around her is related with her ancestry. Oh, because uh, her husband, who was also his manager, uh, he spread over the story that she was a descendant of the Incas. Mm -hmm. So was she able to read music? Jessica, I am sure, yes, eventually she moved to the United States in uh, where she was able to receive education for reading music, but not for... A, like a sort of like a, to to impose the voice to to a, sort of like she didn't change the the natural way she learned to sing mm -hmm. and she was so famous because possibly her exotic uh, exactly Jessica that's what I wanted to say no vocal coaching that's right she didn't have any mentoring in terms of how to sing. Uh, um, so she became immediately spotted by uh, the big uh, uh, like, uh, producers of, of movies in Hollywood and she was called to participate in the famous film The Secret of the Incas with Charlton Heston uh, uh, and also later in another famous movie Omar Kayam. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the first one here, The Secret of the Incas, mm -hmm. uh, she portrayed an Incan woman. Mm -hmm. And this is also uh, one of the reasons how she became, in a way, a representer of the Peruvian culture in the world. She was loved by the Peruvians, by the Americans, by the world. Uh, her singing was unique unique but the time passed and things started to become complicated for her uh, by the way I have here a question Larry's asking why did Sam think she was from Brooklyn <laughs> excellent did she live there Larry uh, there were actually some sort of like um, like a, 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 I am trying to find the 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 word uh, specifically like uh, gossips um, a, um a spread over about where she was from this was also a way for a uh, sort of like creating mystery around her and making her more attractive right so um for example well exactly you no know, like a like tabloids I, I think people will say nowadays right so yellow press we say in peru prensa amarilla so uh, there were things that possibly uh, by her manager which was also her husband so the intention was just calling attention about her right so people believe she was from a uh, Bolivia and also uh, this idea that she was from uh, Brooklyn uh, also th that and the original name they said now this new said that it was a uh, let me let me I have the name Amy Camus Amy Camus they believe she was Amy Camus uh, and Amy Camus is Ima Sumac, but backwards. <laughs> so anyways, um, she said in a couple of occasions in, uh, that she was Peruvian, of course, very proud Peruvian, right? So excellent public relations. That's right, Marilyn. So, um, well, the problem uh, between Ima Sumac and Peru started in the year 1955. And the reason is because that was the year when she became American citizen. And it was not because she didn't want it to be Peruvian. She actually represented Peru for many years in the States. But the problem was related with taxes. Uh, she, had, um, she had to pay lots of taxes as a foreigner in the United States. And it would be easier for her if she was American. So that's why she uh, became American. <laughs> This is her most famous song, probably. And, well, this is Gobert Mambo. Let me know if you recognize this song. Nobody has been able to sing her songs in the way she, she done it. Because her voice, radio is unique. 
she could sing as a soprano, mezzo soprano, contralto, tenor, baritono, and bass. There's nobody that has been able to be so comfortable singing in all of these different, let's say, forms like her. So, well, and this is a little bit of this beautiful woman. Now, let's continue. Oh, sorry. I will put a stop to the song because we have more to see. Okay. And now, we will continue. I have many slides, as you've seen, prepared. So, it, oh, before we finish with, with her, let me tell you something that I find very interesting about Ima Sumac. Ima Sumac was the queen of the fusion. She was not afraid of fusioning the indigenous folk music, Peruvian music, with mambo, with jazz, with even rock and roll. She released an album in the 70s called Miracles, in which she fusioned her music with rock. In that time, rock, rock was starting to become a trend. And therefore, she was hated by the most Puritans, by, by the people, uh, Peruvians especially, who were uh, very, very uh, like uh, into preserving the original folk music, indigenous folk music. She was hated uh, like for uh, being the person she was. And there was a big resentment of many Peruvians towards her. Later in 2006, she was able to return home and she was given a prize uh, uh, in recognition of the many years that she dedicated to uh, spread over the found the music of Peru. Oh, and that she always said that she was Peruvian, although she became American, but she always said, I am Peruvian, right? So this is what I recopilate from, from her life, oh? that she fought for, their, for her dreams. She was a fighter uh, from beginning to end. And she, when she returned in 2006, she received her, the love of her people, of, her, of the Peruvians, Unfortunately, two years after, in 2008, she died from cancer. In her dream, well, she said in 2006, it was she wanted to return to Peru and died here, but she was not able to, to do it. So thank you, Andrew. Muchas gracias. Thanks for your cooperation. Uh, and please keep in mind that all what we're going to be, um, uh, let's say, today uh, recopilated in tips is going to be donated to the Red Cross to help uh, the Air Force uh, in, in um, Ukraine. So muchas gracias. Thank you. So we have here another lady, and this lady is one of the most important related with the history, archaeology, uh, um, anthropology of Peru. Mm -hmm. Her name is Maria Rostorovsky. Oh, and before I go to, uh, to the story of Maria Rostorovsky, let me tell you something. Here I have the books. Here you have two of the many editions of books Maria Rostorovsky have done in Peru. They are fundamental books for many of my uh, tours, especially about archaeology and colonial period. Especially for me, this one, she focused a lot in investigating the women in the pre-Hispanic times and the early colonial period. This is her book dedicated to the daughter of Francisco Pizarro, of Francisca Pizarro, the first mestiza of Peru. And why she was interested in Francisca Pizarro? Hmm. Well, maybe because they had something in common. And why was uh, that thing in common? Well, she was a mestiza herself. She was the daughter of a Polish man. Gracias, Larry. Thank you for your tip support. Muchas gracias. And a Peruvian from Puno uh, in the high plateau of Peru. Uh, Mr. Jan and Mrs. Rita. So Maria Rostorovsky was born in a home that embraced two complete different 
cultures and which she both loved very much but as a woman of course she had to face situations of her time that i think she overcome overcame wonderfully no? so here you can see for example something interesting she was married two times and in the time when she divorced the 1940s 19 uh, 1940s basically uh, from her first husband uh, life was not easy for a divorcee uh, woman but she later remarried of course uh, her second husband uh, Peruvian the first one was Polish also show us that she was a woman of world and that she loved very much both nations, Poland and Peru. So a little bit about her story. Well, she uh, was born in Lima, in Barranco, uh, in 1915. And, well, she was taken to Poland early in her life. Oh, so in Poland, she received a very, very good education. She belonged to a um, middle upper class oh, in Poland. And uh, she received the best education of that time. Uh, also, she did not attend that schools. She had uh, what we call institutrices, uh, which were uh, teachers. I think there's a specific word for, for that in English, right? Like tutor, someone that is uh, coaching you at home. Um, so her family uh, did not governess. Gracias, Diana. Exactly. No, she had a governess, so the family was perfectly wealthy enough for giving her education in their home. She also lived in the countryside, right? So she had no needs uh, in her life, uh, indeed. Uh, and, oh yes, yes, Marilyn, Mike, my friend, Mike Lasso, uh, uses a lot also her books. And you will see something really interesting about her life in a moment because one would say, well, maybe this woman is studied in the best universities in Peru or, or in Europe. Well, um, she was educated very well, but with the intentions of her family to, you know, like marry her well, right? Things ended up completely different. She ended up be being married two times, right? Uh, so here we have a list of the books that she published. Actually, if you wish, you can make a a screenshot of or maybe looking for these books. Most of them have translations into English also. Um, but imagine something. This lady, this lady did not attend a university. She never went to a university. Why? Well, the story is that she uh, lived in Poland. She married in Poland. She even traveled to different parts of Europe. Um, she was uh, actually married first to a man that was uh, a count. So she, he had a novel status uh, in Poland. So she had no lacks of, of any, any money. Uh, but she was uh, always reading and very interested in the culture of Peru. So she returned to Peru. She came to Peru with her husband and she said also in some uh, interviews that she didn't ask her husband to come with her. She said, I'm going to Peru and he followed her. <laughs> so she said, well, you know, if he didn't like it, I will never feel guilty of that because he wanted to come. <laughs> uh, so anyways, she here started to uh, find that she was not very happy in that marriage. So they had one daughter, but they, they separated. She divorced, right? So then she remarried, and the second husband she had was very supportive as well. He was a count, too. In Peru, we had back then still some royal descendants, right, from the colonial times. So, well, she um, found in this man uh, her compliment because he supported her education at home, like have to read about history. So he was so, so, so supportive. She was in the glory. And he was the person who pushed her to publish her first book, which is this one here, Pachac Pachacutec. So Pachacutec was the first book of Maria Rostorovsky. And she did this book 
all alone. What happened is that she thought that there was a big lack in the in the books of that time about history, that all the books were from Europeans, most of them from European perspective. And also these books sort of like focused too much in the myths instead of the facts. Of it. And she with her own money, went to different parts of Peru, to different archives, and I started to recopilate information about the Inca Pachacute, which is considered to be the creator of the empire of the Incas. So she created this book and it became a boom. Uh, she's what, this is one of the best selling books she had, right? So let's go now to again the, the screen. So I hope you were able to take uh, a picture of the many, many books that she made. And especially notice, for example, Doña Francisca Pizarro. Mm? And we have also this one here, La Mujer en la Época Prehispánica, Women in the Prehispanic Times. So she focused a lot in this topic of women that nobody cared about in that period, the 1960s, 70s, 80s. So basically, she was a pioneer in, uh, in, in focusing in the role of women in, this, in the colonial and prehispanic times. So I have a question over here. Dunia is asking, was it well received at the start of the publication? Not really, my dear friend, not for all these scholars, not by all the scholars, because remember that she was not universitarian. She had no universitarian degree, right? So uh, that's why in the beginning, it was extremely hard for her to find a, a space among the most respected uh, archaeologists and, and historians, but she received the help of some of them, which became very good friends of her. Like, for example, Raul Polas Barrenechea, he is considered to be also one of the greatest uh, teachers, university teachers of Peru of all times. And he asked her to follow uh, free courses in the University of San Marcos. So in that way, she will be able to... Um, let's say, to, to, uh, to, to have some extra, let's say, information about, for example, uh, public future publications uh, like that, right? So uh, her best-selling book is this one, History of the Tahuantinsuyo or History of the Inca Rehome, which I highly, highly recommend you to buy online if you wish or also um, to understand the history of the Inca Empire of the Tahuantinsuyo, right? So uh, just a little bit of her um, before we pass to the next lady. And we are going to, <laughs> you know, there's always uh, an app. So let me skip this one. Let me also find some translation into English because now oh, we have this option. Let me just go down English and let's put it here just a little bit. Varios sitios donde no se conocía el uso del dinero. Y eso es muy importante tenerlo en cuenta porque fue uno de los ejes de la organización del Estado Inca. O sea que los Incas tomaron e hicieron suyo las antiguas costumbres andinas y tiene que ver con la minca y con el año. Se puede decir que la reciprocidad es un sistema organizativo socioeconómico que regulaba las prestaciones de servicio a distintos niveles y que servía de engranaje en la producción y distribución de los bienes. Porque... Ok, so this is just a little bit of her also in an interview and she's talking about the reciprocity. Have you heard before about the reciprocity? Oh, she says that, um, and one of the things that also that, that is, let's say, the most important pillar of her investigations oh, is that the reciprocity, oh, it, it was the, the way how 
currency, the coins, money was replaced, right? So in societies where there was no um, money, uh, physical money, so reciprocity was a way to connect people, connect cultures. No? Also that she mentioned that uh, nowadays we say, for example, Coast, Andes, and Django, we divide these three regions, right, in Peru. She said that in the pre-Hispanic times, there was no division at all. Uh, the Andes uh, had also continued to the coast, so they were the same sort of like a system, and the same on the other side, the jungle, no? So that's why all of these cultures were interconnected. They were not separated right so let's continue oh, this is a little bit of the recognitions that she received and remember she was not able to study in a university she never put a step uh, a feet in a university because she couldn't remember that she was she received education at her home with governesses so uh, when she came to peru and she tried to go to the university the university did not recognize her, you know, like education, because she had no documents uh, about, for example, what type of education she received. So she was not able to go to university. She was neglected that opportunity, but she didn't care. She continued with her investigation. She is a, a self-taught, let's say, historian, uh, and she is considered one of the most important writers of Peru and one of the most respected writers in Peru. So what I, why I rescue from, from this woman uh, is her boldness as well. You know, the world was saying, you cannot do it. You are a woman. You cannot write. You cannot go to the university. You cannot uh, be taken serious. But she did not care about the world. She had a husband who supported her. Uh, and, well, how many of us have the opportunity of having someone next uh, that is, you know, like this, strong, that supported us and said, you can do it. Not many of us have that chance, but we have that power inside. We don't need the world to tell us, you know, that we worth, that we can do it. We have to say it to us. Uh, so she is a great example of someone uh, that wanted to become a writer and she became one and not just a writer, one of the best, right? So, and now to finish this event, and yes, indeed, Diana, oh, un ejemplo a seguir is a great example. Uh, and well, I'm sure uh, the, the other two women they have presented you possibly were not familiar. And this lady, of course, possibly will not be familiar to you all, but I'm sure you're going to end up loving her. And this Afro-Peruvian lady, look also that I didn't make this intentionally, but at the end, we were able to see examples of an indigenous woman, a mestiza woman, uh, a descendant of Europeans, and here an Afro-Peruvian. Uh, and this Afro-Peruvian woman is recognized as the Madre Coraje. What does Madre Coraje mean? Hmm? Marielena Moyano, the Madre Coraje, uh, Mother Courage. Mm? Mother Courage, the reason of her name you are going to see in a moment. I'm going to justify this name in just a little while. So uh, Maria Elena Mora Moyano is uh, from the group of the ladies I have presented you, the youngest uh, in terms of age, but also uh, a, a fighter and we are now talking about a different fight we're talking about the fight in the streets the fight in the poor locations of Peru the fight of women that were not born with the possibilities with the education with the beautiful boys and the beautiful looks uh, the women that are sometimes anonymous uh? so she uh, is recognized as one of the feminists of her time and also an uh, organizer. She organized um, groups in her, in her town, uh, sorry, in her district where she lived, uh, a, of women uh, to, that were, as her, in poverty uh, to together 
be able to sustain their families. But this period in which she lived is the terrible period of the shining path. Have you heard about the shining path before, my friends, or the MRTA? Let me know if you have heard about the shining path. Yes, Diana mentions that she have heard about the Sendero Luminoso. Maria Sendero Luminoso was a terrible terrorist group, a paramilitary group that I also will be doing a series of events uh, very, very soon to explain about how the Shining Path and the MRTA emerged in Peru in the time of the 70s. So the Shining Path was a response to the extreme poverty that Peru was living back then and also to the years of mistreatments the indigenous people of Peru suffered since the arrival of the conquistadors and the open wombs. The problem is that this Shining Path, this MRTA, which were communists initially, uh, became not just extreme against the government, they also fear and kill poor indigenous people as well. Because if you were not part of the revolution, you were against the revolution, and that's why they ended up killing you. Maria Elena Moyano, in the other hand, she was a fighter, but she was pro-life, pro-peace. She believed in the democracy. She was against the anarchy, and she was completely against the shining path and the fear they created. She, as a leaderess, oh, she even became uh, a, what, what you will call, I think, uh, Lu, uh, deputy mayor. Oh, yes, it's over here. Deputy mayor of Villa El Salvador, which was her district. Mm? Uh, and you will see in a moment some videos about her district, right? Uh, she was eventually murdered by the Shining Path. So she also cooperated oh, with the district she helped to form. When she was very little, she moved to the Arenal, to the sand dunes in the outside of, of the city of Lima with her mother, which was a divorcee woman, and her, the mother of Maria Elena. She had several children, so they had no money to pay the rents in the city of Lima, so yet they went to squat in the sands of the outskirts of Lima. And she helped uh, also Maria Elena since very little to build the community. And that's why in the year 1987, she received, she went in representation to Spain, in representation of her community to receive the prize Prince of Asturias because her community became an example of a great organization of people in peace, solidarity uh, uh, in peace, right? Which was completely against the belief of the terrorists. So that's why the terrorists hate her. The terrorists tried to ask her in many occasions to give her, uh, to give them money from the organization. So the organization functioned like this. There were several uh, communities well, well organized in the outskirts of Lima. This is not just a shanty town, uh, a shanty town that there's nothing uh, there, like people live poor, isolated. These people believe in organization and they sort of like transmitted or so received the knowledge of the, uh, the Inca organization and they use the same in this present times. So all of the mothers that were all Nicolas, that were all, um, let's say, at home because we are talking about the 70s is still machistic world so men goes out to work women stay at home so women stay at home with their kids right so to do something right what they did was uh, pointing out leaders in every little like a quadrant of the of the community and these leaders will also create a system of uh, soup kitchens so the soup kitchens were organized in a way that all the mothers of the community will rotate, right? And they will like, for example, Monday, I will go to cook. Next day, another person will cook. And I will be able every day to be beneficiary of the food that is cooked there with the money of the community and also with help from the government. So this was the way how these people were, face, were facing malnutrition, for example, which was the number one problem of these communities, right? So, but 
Uh, unfortunately, the terrorists wanted that money and she completely opposed to giving that money away to the terrorists. This is, these are some pictures of how this place, Villa El Salvador, looked like when she first moved to that place and later on the community grew very beautiful and nowadays it's such an amazing site that I am planning also to do at some point, a tour to show you how Villa El Salvador looks nowadays. So I hope you would like to see this place because it's really interesting. So this is the sand dunes. And here you have Maria Elena with her children. She had a family of her own. And although she was, you know, like a, a mother and she had a husband, she never, never stopped her work to defend uh, the peace, that they were living in, the mothers she protected also. She was a leader in all ways. So uh, here, first of all, some little videos about, about this. Let me first go in direction to this, the sand dunes. This is the way how her home looked like initially when she went to Villa El Salvador in the 70s with her family. Her mother uh, was alone. She had children. She couldn't pay for rents. The rents were very expensive in Lima. The only option for many of these poor families was moving to the outskirts. And you might think that maybe there was some level of anarchy in these places because there's no, you know, leader. But no, uh, these places were organized, but initially were organized by men. And she said that the problem was that, you know, men don't know very well how the organization of a community should be. So that's why women took the, uh, let's say, the control eventually and thanks especially to her right so now let me show you what she's done the arenal which by the way my dear diana it's no longer existing like that in in lima because it has been all um constructed over it, it used to be located in the outskirts of the whole city remember that lima lays on the desert mm -hmm. but um well, things change, and look how uh, she, when she went to that place when she was about 13, 13 years old, and then she worked with her family to create uh, something completely different, to build a city. This is how she looked uh, in, her, in her years of leaderess. Uh, and also you can see here, the soup kitchens that she helped to organize. So the system, as I was saying, was that the mothers will rotate. Usually remember that, but then there was a lot of machismo. Women stay at home. They were the ones that cook. But when you cook in a group, uh, things can be better. You know, you can nourish better the community. And also you can have other days to be free to work in other duties. For example, you can become a, a maid at a house in a middle class part of Lima the other days. And you know that your children will receive food for sure because the community will take care of the meals of the children, right? So, and here, oh, I'm trying to give you some quick videos. Oh, sorry, I think I didn't stop the video. Let me stop first the video. I hope you are enjoying this this series that I'm creating for you. And as I was saying, my intention was uh, showing you um, a little bit of these women, uh, that we don't have much of, of about them in the streets of Lima nowadays. So this is, uh, gracias Diana, thank you. This is a recreation of her death. I mean, if you are too sensitive, please, uh, try to put this just a little bit away just to give you an idea how terrible the terrorists were with the people, right? And this is a movie that I highly recommend you to watch uh, uh, that is called Courage. It is online 
in internet, this is uh, before we, we pass. So she was a, in many occasions a threatened by the terrorists to shut up, right? But uh, she did not want it to shut up. She said, I trust in the women of, of the community and if I die, I will die here. But her friends asked her to, to not continue being so public, to stop talking. So um, even her friends found her refuge in Spain. So she could go to Spain at any time. And they were preparing the flight tickets for her children to go to, to Spain, right? To, for a time. She didn't want it to go, but well, at the end, she took it serious for her kids, especially. So she received an invitation one day to a party. We call it chicken party pollada. So she did not want it to attend first, but she said, well, I, th I have to go because maybe this is going to be my last time visiting Villa El Salvador, her, her town, no? her, her, her place. So she went there and there is where she got an attack, a terrorist attack. So uh, I'm going to put, sorry, uh, the video for, from the section where she arrives. Okay. And we're going to put play. So... And this is the exact recreation tale by her bodyguard, which was put by the government because she was a very important leader. Those are her kids. And they went to this party. Um, many people said, don't go. But she said, oh, I have to go at least to say bye to my, the mothers of the community. And when she arrived, seems that this was organized actually to be her execution. Because she received an invitation and the person she went to, which was the leaderess of that community, she said, oh, thanks for coming. We thought you were in Spain. And she said, but how come you gave me an invitation? And she said, no, I didn't give you an invitation. But well, the important thing is that you are here, she said, right? And she started to feel a little bit nervous, the children of her tell that story also because they were right there and the one thing that alerted the children was that the person that was um, organizing the ceremony or uh, she's he said in the speaker Maria Elena Moyano is here or we are very happy to have her and this was a big alert the terrorists were after her for a long time because remember, they wanted the people to be afraid of them. They wanted the people to be silent. And they also attack and kill many leaders of the communities of different parts because they like anarchy. But they believe that this woman was way too dangerous and they had to kill her in an exemplar way. So what they did was terrible. By the way, this movie, you can see it in internet, is called Coraje. She, one of the things that people say that were there in the party, she asked everybody to leave the party. She knew they were after her only. And her last words were, shoot, shoot is what she said at the end. But this was not enough for the terrorist group as they put dynamite in her body to make this an example. So I will skip that part because it's very strong. But basically what I wanted to share with you is that this woman, and let me, there's one last thing I want to tell you because the story is not ending here. Oh no. The story ends, what about her sons? Let me tell you. Um, here first I'm going to put this video and I will give you a little bit of information about her sons. Do you remember that they were um, finding uh, tickets for, tickets for her? For, to go to Spain. So after the attack of her, her husband and two children were taken to Spain and they are still living in Spain.
they live the rest of their life there because the terrorism was defeated finally that same year thanks to you know uh, the the work uh, of the people of the poor zones of lima that were sick of all the terrorism and also that love very much the work uh, maria elena moyano did uh, uh, and the terrorists believe that dynamiting their bo her body exploiting her body in pieces will destroy the moral of the people that finally people will get that there was no other way than the terrorist way they were completely wrong they created a hero when they killed her and the effect was the exact opposite few months after she was killed the terrorists failed the terrorists were founded, all of them. And that was in part thanks to all the people that let know the police about where the terrorists were. They maybe believe at some point of the dreams of the terrorists, but what they did to Maria Elena, to a woman that was a good person, that was a good mother, a good leader, was something people could not take. Gracias, Diana. Thank you so much. So look at this. Uh, um, I have... I think some videos about her uh, oh, over here. This is her funeral. Look at the mass of people going to the cemetery, following her to her last resting place. This is what happened after she died. This is her mother. So this is what happened. Uh, the terrorists put the string in their own neck after killing Marilena Moyano. And that's why we consider her mother courage. So I leave you with this image at the end of this event. Diana, Marilyn, thank you so much for your support. Today, this is a special day because we are celebrating being women we are celebrating the opportunities now we are given we are celebrating uh being able to do whatever we want uh, um, in any field we want and be completely confident uh without you know like having someone you know someone pointing the finger towards us saying you should not do that because you're a woman, right? But all of these things we take for granted. Like uh, if I want to be a writer, I can be a writer. It can, if I want to fusion indigenous art with international art, I can do it. Uh, if I want to speak up uh, about, you know, criminals, I can do it. Back then it was not the moment yet when women could do it. And these women were pioneers oh? and they are the representers of that strength women have mm? and also that delicacy also women have, right? So uh, we are a perfect creation uh? and we are now able to come out to the world pride of being a woman and being able also to educate, to raise our children with the person we love. And alone, if it's necessary, without, you know, turning our face down. These women show us that we can thrive in any situation, in any uh, sphere. Uh, and that's why I thought it would be beautiful to share her stories with you all. Thank you so much for your participation. Gracias, Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, please, if you can, gracias, Nani. If you can, please follow uh, a little bit more about them in internet. You will find lots of good documentaries about them in English as well. Lots of literature about them. Don't let die uh, the, the, the stories of these women, uh, the, the memory of these women, uh, because that's the only way we died when people forget about us. And also, well, the other wonderful women, are, my colleagues have been also explained about during this day. Muchas gracias, Marsh. Thank you so much for your tip support. All what we've been able to uh, recollect today is going to go 
straight directly to the Red Cross and also to the um, to the guys of Ukraine. I'm going to also at the end of this event sharing how much we were able to recopulate. I know the time in the day is not the best. Not many people can um, come, especially because now there are so many other guys and so many other tours. But I highly, highly appreciate, deeply, deeply appreciate that you were here. Gracias, Jessica, that you were here uh, trying to, to help me to to you know, to, to do something uh, in, in, uh, on behalf of the people that are suffering also in Ukraine and especially uh, these, these women uh, that are there for their children, for their spouses, for their sons. Uh, so muchas gracias. Best to you all. Have a lovely rest of the day. I extended as always a little bit more my tour. I hope I am not um, overlapping with another event. I think there's one coming immediately after. Lee is going to be doing a, um, a, a event also about women. And if you would like to follow my um, all my, my social media, maybe you are new to my channel remember that you can do it first of all clicking in the upper part of the screen maybe this part of the screen um, uh, for to follow my my channel and there you're going to see also all my social media I have a YouTube channel I have Instagram all is there in my profile so muchas gracias take care have a lovely 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 rest of the day see you soon lots of love muchas gracias 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 thank you have a lovely rest of the day. Take care. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.